uh, Rupert, Hi. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, um, self uh, self presence in relation to the concept of emptiness in Buddhism. I'm not a very good person to ask about that because I've not really studied Buddhism. And I know that the um, emptiness teachings uh, they're not exactly the same. They don't mean by emptiness exactly what I mean when I speak of um, open, empty awareness. But as I say, I'm not uh, really the person to ask. But, but if, you, if you hear like emptiness is form and form is emptiness, I mean, for me, in my perception, that's like equal to Shiva and Shakti. But as you say, when they speak to Buddhists, they actually say there is not, not such a thing as self. So Yes, well, if by there is not, such a thing as the self they mean there is not such a thing as a discrete individual self then then that would be in agreement with this perspective there is no real temporary finite self as a separate entity but in Hindu concept it's not a separate entity because self is interconnected well, in, in in the Vedantic tradition the, what is called self or I is understood to be uh, the Paramatman the, the infinite awareness and the Atman or the self that each of us considers ourselves to be is um, a reflection of the light of the Paramatman in each of our finite minds. So the, the I that each of us feels, now everybody now feels I, or myself, that I is, it seems to share the limitations of the body and thus seems to be temporary and finite. But it, this I that each of us feels is in fact a reflection in the mind of the only I there truly is. God's infinite eye, or the eye of the Paramatman. So that is why the, the feeling of being, or the sense I am, is considered uh, to be, is so important. It's why I am is considered the, the holy name, the sacred name, because the sense I am in each of us, or the feeling of being, is the portal it is the mind's access to its reality. It is why Know Thyself was written above the tempo, temple of Apollo at Delphi. To know thyself, to know what we mean by I or I am. Although the I, the I that each of us considers ourselves to be seems to be limited, that I is in fact the only I there is the eye of infinite consciousness. So the very, that means the very awareness with which you are now aware of your experience, although that awareness seems to be limited by your body, is in fact the only infinite awareness there is. Just like the space in this room seems to be limited by the walls of the room. Yes, if, if we were to ask mo most people, what is the dimensions of the space in this room? We would say that the, it's 10 meters by 15 meters. In other words, it seems that the space in this room shares the limitations of the room itself. And if we believe that, we believe that it, in the world there are n innumerable spaces. Each room being its own confined space. 
But when this building is taken down, nothing will happen to the space inside it. Indeed, nothing happened to the space when the building was put up. Imagine the world before there were any buildings. Yes, imagine the universe. There was just one space. There is only one space, physical space, in the universe. Yeah. And then each time a house is put up, the space seems to be contained b and, the, and as a result to share the limits of the house. So it seems that there are innumerable spaces or innumerable houses on the earth. But when all those houses come down, the space will remain exactly as it has always been. It was never really divided when the buildings appeared. And it doesn't suddenly reunite with the outside space when the building comes down. Nothing ever happens to the space. It's always been the same single indivisible and relatively speaking, infinite space. Well, consciousness is like that. It seems to be enclosed by each of our bodies. And as a result, each of our, uh, our the, the consciousness, the awareness with which each of us now knows our experience seems to be limited by and to share the destiny of the body. Just like the space in us seems to be limited by and share the destiny of the building. But it doesn't. The space, the, the space in this room is the same infinite space that it was before the building was put up and that it will be when the building is put down, that it's taken down. It won't be destroyed when the building is destroyed. That's why the great, great ones say before they leave the body and people are very upset, where can I go? I, yes, exactly. W where can I go? Because I, I awareness, I, I, I was never incarnate, that is, nev I was never in the body in the first place. This, the space in this room is not incarnate in this room. It is not in this room. This room is in fact appearing in the space that it seems to contain. So the I in each of us, when we say I, I am aware of my thoughts, I am aware of my feelings, I am aware of the sound of this voice, the I that is aware seems to be contained within and to share the limits and destiny of the body. But in fact it is the body that is contained within it. So when the Buddhists say there is no self, if by that they mean there is no temporary, finite, separate self. There is no limited space. The space in this room is not really limited. If they mean that, then we agree. But if they mean th that there is no... If they deny the existence of the space itself, if they say that objects and awareness co-arise together, then we're not in agreement. If by emptiness they mean that no object has its own independent existence, then we agree that all objects borrow their apparent existence from the reality of consciousness, just as the landscape in the movie doesn't have an existence of its own. It borrows its apparent reality from the, uh, the true reality of the screen. But if they deny the reality of the screen itself... Even, even if it is meant that there is no such a thing as self as a separate in, uh, entity, that's even that is not correct in the true understanding because we know it's interrelated. You, s you understand what I'm the, saying? The, the self is interrelated, yes, do you mean? Yes, because the self in me is the same as the self in you, and it is um, related to yes. the Paramatma. So, yes, so there is no, there is no real, discrete self. There's no self with its own independent existence. Yes. The self yes. of each of us is simply an apparent limitation yes. on 
infinite, the only self, if we can call it a self, there is. Now the reason in this tradition we call it the, the self is because the self is the name that each of us gives to ourself. We, we talk about myself. When we talk about that which is most intimate in ourselves, we call it myself or I. So I or the self is a good name for that which is essential to what we are. I mean, we have to call it some. if we're going to speak of it, we have to call it something. And in this tradition, the words self or I are considered good names because they already refer to what we consider ourselves to be, essentially. It's true that the word I or self usually implies something personal or limited. So in that sense, the words I or self are not so good. And in fact, the word God is at the other end of the extreme. If I is considered to be that which is most intimate and personal, God is considered to be that which is most vast and infinite and impersonal. So for that reason, God is a good word, except that in our culture, God is at a distance from ourselves. So both these words have have uh, qualities that are true and qualities that are misleading. <coughs> Whatever we call it, something is. Th there is experience, yes? We must all agree on that, whether we're Buddhists or Christians or atheists or agnostics, we must agree that there is experience. There is not nothing. It's true that experience may not be a collection of things, but even so, it is still not a void, that there is something. And the question is, what is that? We, we, it's true that all our language describes the parts, so we don't have a word for the whole. But we do the best we can with our language to describe what is the reality of that which is experienced. I, I, experience is real. Th we can't be, we, this might be a dream. We can't be sure we're not dreaming. We might be having a kind of dream. Ju because when we dream at night, our night dream appears to be as real as the waking state does. So we can't be sure, just as it, when, when we dream at night, we think we're in the waking state. Then we wake up and we realize, oh, I was dreaming. We can't be sure we're not dreaming now. But even if we are, there is still a reality to this dream. Just as the Caribbean beach that we were sunbathing on in our dream last night was an illusion. But nevertheless, there was something real about that illusion. What is that? Even if this is an illusion, even if it's not an outside world, it is something. There is something real. All experience is real. Have you ever had an unreal experience? Would it be possible to have an unreal experience? It, 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 it's not possible. All experience is real. A near-death experience, a vision of God, a toothache, a, um, a vision, a cup of tea, or a dream of a Caribbean beach, Caribbean beach. All experience is real. The question is, what is that? What is it that is unmistakably real about experience? And, and whatever we call it is not important. But what is important is that our words uh, evoke it as accurately as possible. And we should be very careful to discriminate between viewpoints that 
just use language in different ways but are actually saying the same thing and language uh, viewpoints that use the same language but are in fact saying different things yes i'm tending to to think that um in my perception that actually they they it's just a matter of words but it's about the same thing but if you keep on studying more then you you get to feel that it, there is really an uh, essential difference and this i cannot understand because those who have come to self-realization or those who have reached buddhahood they've come to the same realization yes it's true I, I everyone who, who uh, the recognition is is the same recognition in all cases but, but don't don't think that everybody that writes and speaks about these matters, although their language may be similar, is talking about the same thing. Don't, don't um, buy too easily the, um, the belief, oh, all these teachings are different fingers pointing at the same moon. Some of them are, and some of them aren't. And it's, you have to be discriminating even on the, the, the relatively small field of, of, of non-duality. Uh, there are many, now that the, w with this um, recent proliferation of non-duality, contemporary non-duality on the website in the last, on the web in, in, the, in the last, what, five or, or ten years, there are all kinds of ideas that superficially are similar and turn out on further investigation to be very different. Panpsychism is the is the uh, um, most common one. Panpsychism, the belief that consciousness is in everything. Uh, superficially, the belief that consciousness is in everything would seem to be consistent with and identical to the consciousness only model. And in fact, many physicists now who um, are open to the possibility that consciousness is uh, a fundamental aspect of reality, uh, have uh, added consciousness to their materialistic model. And they think that consciousness is somehow, that, that all of matter has a degree of consciousness. This is panpsychism, the belief that consciousness pervades all of matter. But it, and it appears to be what we're saying here. It's not. The, the panpsychism is a, it's a, it's a, it's a materialistic belief. It starts with matter and then it adds consciousness to matter and says that all matter is conscious to a greater or lesser extent. First of all, people, it starts with the belief, I, the body, am aware. It is this body that has consciousness, that consciousness is an attribute of the body. And then if we start there, we, we think that dogs and cats also have consciousness. And we go further and we think that um, snails and fishes and slugs and worms and fleas also have a degree of consciousness. And then we go further, trees and plants and grasses have consciousness and then maybe even concrete and, and um, metal has some degree of consci consciousness and we end up with the belief that everything has a degree of consciousness and as a result of this belief we believe that one day we will make a conscious computer and this is where the artificial intelligence um, is based on, on the belief that it starts with the belief either body and conscious and if, uh, if consciousness is an attribute of the body, then it's only a matter of time before we build a computer that is conscious. But it, it starts with a mistake. The mistake is, it's not I, the body, that is conscious. Consciousness is not an attribute of the body. It is consciousness that is conscious. Only awareness is aware. So human beings are not aware dogs and cats and fishes and snails and fleas and amoebas and grasses and plants are not aware. 
computers will never be aware. So only awareness is aware. So this is just an example. Sorry, I'm getting carried away. Um, <laughs> this is an example of, of an idea. And, and it's, uh, it's not for no reason that I say this, because it's very prevalent in the science and non-duality scene at the moment. This apparent mixture of science and non-duality. Psych Panpsychism is really the forefront of this uh, mixing of science and consciousness studies. It's considered to be the kind of cutting edge of where non-duality and science meet. But it's a mistake. It's based on the fundamental, the, the original mistake, I the body am aware. So that's a very good example. You, you often hear people saying everything is, there's consciousness in everything. And this sounds similar to what we are saying here, but it's not. If you look at it closely, it's not. It's a materialistic view. If it is during the round, it's true. Yes, it's not that consciousness is not in everything, because there are no things with their own... No. To say consciousness is in everything is to grant things too much existence. To say the universe is conscious is to grant too much existence to the universe. It is to first presume the existence of something called a universe, and then to add a quality of consciousness to it. It's the wrong way round. We have to start with consciousness. Why? Obviously, it is our primary experience. Consciousness is what is first in experience. So if we want to build a model of reality, we don't start with the universe and then ascribe consciousness to it. We should start with consciousness for the simple reason that it is our primary experience and then see how something called a universe appears in consciousness. But then it's a matter of language because without consciousness the flea would not pee, the bee would not pee. So, sorry? Then it's a matter of language because co without consciousness the flea would not be or the tree would not be alive. Then. Instead of yes, but no, that, that, that's true. The flea or the tree derives its being from the only one that truly is. But that's another thing from saying that consciousness pervades the object. But if you say the screen doesn't pervade the image. To say the screen pervades the image, you first have to start with the image and then say the screen pervades it. But what is the image? independent of the screen. There is no such thing called an image that is pervaded by the screen. The screen does not pervade the image. There is no such independently existing thing called an image that may or may not be pervaded by a screen. There is just the screen that appears to itself as the image and as such is made of the image, uh, as such is made of the screen. But there is no independently existing thing called the screen. 